Zinzendorf understood that people that were committed to hourly intercession needed to be fed the Word of God, right? It was a, it was a diet of truth, and it helped to direct their prayers. Well, here we are again. This is podcast number two of a very special series with Dr. Jason Hubbard, who's a Presbyterian minister. He's a man of letters. He loves Jesus. He is currently the leader of the uh, International Prayer Council uh, with a great team behind him, and they are raising up prayer right around the world. He's over well over a decade been involved in 24-7 prayer in uh, his beautiful town of Whatcom County, <clears throat> and just a bit north of Seattle, and uh, just south of the uh, Canadian border in the north western side of the USA. He loves Jesus immensely. He loves missions. But both Jason and myself, my name is Warwick Marsh, we both have a deep love for the Moravians and Count Zinzendorf. And what these guys did in missions is just absolutely astounding. And we have talked a bit about that already in podcast number one. Please check it out if you haven't already. And here we go. We're going to get stuck in to the leader of the Moravians at that time, because the Moravians existed before Zinzendorf. But certainly they really came together under Count Zinzendorf. So uh, great to be talking to you, Jason. Tell us about Count Zinzendorf. Who is this guy? Uh, Give us the background so we can place him in history and understand better the Moravian prayer meeting, a hundred year prayer meeting that changed the world, changed human history for the good. Yeah, amen. Well, great to be with you, Warwick. This is a, such a privilege to talk about one of the great uh, movements in church history, led by a man named Count Zinzendorf. He was a wealthy aristocrat uh, a nobleman by birth, uh, born in the 1700s. Some call him the rich young ruler who said yes. He was a man who gave up his wealth for the sake of the gospel to follow the lamb wherever he goes. Uh, Zinzendorf was born in Dresden and he had a godly praying grandmother. He came to Christ at a young age and was often found in prayer meetings and in his youth, Following in his grandmother's footsteps, uh, he was a teenager, and he has this powerful encounter with Jesus, with the Lord. He was in a gallery in Dusseldorf, and he sees this painting of the crucified Christ. He stares at this for several hours, and he sees the blood dripping from every wound. In a sense, he, he sees love glowing in every tear. He saw grace shining in every brush stroke. And the artist behind this painting, of course, had been saved by Jesus from a life of deep darkness and sin. And now this artist had been painting the very mercy of God, and he paints God's mercy into every line and forgiveness into every blood drop. And at the bottom of the painting were these words. This is what I have done for you. What will you do for me? Zinzendorf reads this caption and he falls to his knees. He's sobbing. And with all of his heart, he promises that for the rest of his life, he would glorify the Lamb for what he had suffered on the cross. Uh, in a sense, in this moment, Zinzendorf, by the Holy Spirit, had been wounded by the wounded one, pierced through by the pierced one, and scarred by the revelation of the sacrifice of the Son of God. Flowing out of Zinzendorf's passionate love for Jesus came a life that was devoted to prayer. He was disciplined in prayer. Uh, he had early on learned the secret of prevailing prayer. And during his time at school, he had already established what he called circles for prayer. 
uh, gatherings of corporate prayer meetings. On leaving the college at 16 years of age, uh, he had handed his professor a list of seven praying societies right there on that campus. Fantastic. Amazing that uh, because of his revelation of Christ and him crucified, that that was what led him into the place of prayer and a deep devotion to Jesus. Uh, prayer being that, that conversational part of the most important love relationship of our lives. Uh, prayer being intimacy with Jesus that leads to the fulfillment of his purposes. It's accomplished by his power and it's all for God's glory. Amen and amen. Any thoughts on that, uh, Warwick, before we move on? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit here, but uh, later on when Zinzendorf would instruct his missionaries before they left, he would encourage them to preach the cross, mm -hmm. preach the death of Jesus, mm -hmm. preach the resurrection of Jesus, yeah. and preach the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're right when you say what you said, that he was he was pierced through with the with the nails of Jesus. He was he was scarred by the scars of Jesus, but in a good way. And he had a grasp of the cross, which goes back to the saying the Moravians had that the lamb that was slain would receive a reward for his suffering. Right, the lamb that was slain. That was their mission. Uh, that was their sort of motto, correct? Yeah, amen. Yeah. And, you know, on further on this note, because um, I have been thinking a lot about it uh, over the last decade or so, um, and, you know, John, the apostle, in you get this picture of heaven, and Jesus, John's looking at Jesus, right? Mm. And, and this is the apostle whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Right. This is the apostle whom Jesus loved. He looks at the throne. He sees a lamb looking like he was slain. Yeah. And this is very unusual. It, it's, it's not really found in other parts of the Bible, is it? It's quite unusual in a beautiful way, I believe, because I believe John had a revelation of the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, perhaps in a deeper revelation than even Paul, with all due respects, although Paul had this incredible grasp of theology, incredible grasp of God's story. John had this insight, I believe, into the lamb that was slain. Mm -hmm. yep. And even myself, as I'm talking to you, I don't fully understand it. But I do believe that Zinzendorf really mm -hmm. somehow maybe it, it, it began at that painting when he was confronted by the, this beautiful picture of Jesus on the cross mm -hmm. and this question, I've done this for you, what will you do for me? Mm -hmm. It transfixed him. Yep. It transposed him. It transformed him. And it made the Moravians ultimately mm -hmm. probably one of the most Christ-centric, gospel-centric, mm -hmm. cross-centric, um, and not just you know, theologically, but in practice, they preach this, live by it, died by it, and changed the world. Yeah. And so, you know, I find it quite fascinating. I, I, I don't claim to fully understand it yet, um, Jason, but you and I do. Both of us actually have a deep passion for the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at Paul, Paul's writing where he says, I came to Corinth, and Paul knew the whole of, you know, had this incredible grasp of church history, mm -hmm. He was taught by, you know, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. Um, he was he was a scholar in his own right and a writer in his own right. And he understood Jesus Christ, but he came to the Corinthian church and said these words, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And I don't know about you, Jason, but I find that statement extraordinary. Yeah. It's totally extraordinary. But I would also argue that somehow or other, Zinzendorf had a grasp of that statement. 
Yeah. Zinzendorf could have well have said the same thing when it came to the Corinthians. I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. I mean, every morning, my wife and I, this morning we had communion. We celebrate. Uh, we've been doing this now for 20 or 21 years. Mm -hmm. I, I believe we'll do it until the day we pass on to glory. Yeah. Because I want to keep my life centered on Jesus. Mm -hmm. I want to keep my life centered on the cross. And so that's another reason that you and I particularly love Zinzendorf and the Moravians, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Yep. What's interesting about that word crucified right there, too, is it's in the perfect tense in Greek, which means he is always the crucified Christ. It is, his blood is always fresh. And that's why we see him as a lamb standing in the center of the throne, looking as if he'd been slain, but he still bears the scars and marks of the crucified one. And, um, you know, you think about the theology of the Passover lamb, and the Exodus story all throughout the Old Testament narrative. Uh, John the Baptist comes on the scene and his, his statement declares, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, the amount of focus in the passion narratives on the crucifixion is astounding. And that week, the passion week leading up to the cross, um, it's like he was a man destined for slaughter uh, set to die, born to die. You know that Paul. The scripture says he set. Cross. Jason, the scripture says he set his face like flint. It Correct. says. Correct. Because he was, he was always facing the cross. Yep. Uh, and you're right, by the way. I've forgotten. I should have mentioned John the Baptist. John the Baptist had the same revelation. Yep. This is the Lamb. This is the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And John the Apostle. Uh, he carried that revelation in a very profound way. I'm not saying that Paul, I think Paul had it too, for sure. Mm -hmm. But but for some reason, John grasped it deeply. And this is why he looked at the, he looks at in heaven, he looks at the throne. Mm. And you and I, I think we would see Jesus, right? Yeah. But John, with a greater revelation, a greater depth says, no, this is the lamb that was slain. For the foundation of the world mm -hmm. and and through him and i didn't know that about the perfect tense in the greek because we often say people say oh you know like just get, let me just sort of just diverge for a second you know a lot of i came from a protestant background mm -hmm. which is quite negative towards the picture of of the cross and jesus on the cross and you know they said oh that jesus has risen we don't need the cruise we don't need to see jesus on the cross but what you've just said shows me that it's quite real and relevant to show Jesus on the cross mm -hmm. because it's the present tense, mm -hmm. correct? That's uh, the perfect tense, yeah. It was perfect tense, sorry. And it's certainly he's the resurrected Christ, ascended Christ. But as the ascended Christ now, um, he still is portrayed as a lamb. In fact, uh, the lamb title for Jesus or the face of Jesus as the lamb is found 28 times in the book of Revelation uh, more than any other more than king or bridegroom uh, Messiah etc it, it's Jesus is described as the lamb uh, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb it's the the wrath of the lamb uh, it's the, the 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 saints are sealed and they're worshiping the Lamb. It says the New Jerusalem, uh, that the Lamb is the lamp of the eternal city. And so this focus on him being a slain one, it honors his sacrifice. And one of the things I think too is, you know, if he's standing even now in the center of the throne as a lamb, looking as if he'd been slain, then I'm, I'm believing that he should be in the center of, of the throne of the hearts of men and in the heart of the church on the earth today that we should honor his sacrifice and i wonder if this is one of the reasons why we haven't seen this this coming global wave of revival because maybe the father is waiting for us to be scarred with the sacrifice of his son like zinzendorf was could he be holding that back until we're so wounded by the wounded one? Mm. 
Because this, this is what it's all about. He is worthy of the nations of the earth as his inheritance because of his sacrifice. Amen and amen. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I'm with you on this. Um, uh, I, I think in many ways, whilst you could argue that prayer empowered the Moravians, in some ways it was more their revelation of the Lamb of God mm -hmm. who was worthy. The Lamb, they had incredible... Perhaps more than any other group, I don't know, Jason, I've never thought of this thought before. I'm talking to you today. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps more than any other group, and that's maybe why they were so effective in total consecration to the cause of Christ, yeah. total consecration to the, the mission of Christ, go into, go, go you into all the world and preach the gospel mm -hmm. uh, to all creation. Um, they really took that incredibly literally and they literally died for it in in their droves. Uh, many of those missionaries did no, never return home. Yeah. And uh, you know the story of that. But we better get back to Zinzendorf. So the rich young ruler, he sees Jesus and he's got these prayer circles. He's got a heart for the glory of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the hymns. He, he's an incredible hymn writer, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. In fact, uh, let, me, let me just go, uh, you know, when you think about prayer, it's for Zinzendorf, it was prayer with worship, or we could call it a worship saturated prayer. Um, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Prayer and praise intermingled together. So, God exalting, Christ exalting prayer. Um, you know, amazing. In fact, he, he wrote, uh, most of the scholars tell us, he wrote at least 2,000 hymns. Um, and many of these focused on the worth of Jesus as the Lamb, on the blood of Christ, on the cross, uh, to help the people in the community of Herenhu, these Moravian believers, to help them uh, lift their eyes and not just focus on themselves, but, but see the glory of Jesus and honor him and adore him in an unceasing way. And out of that place of praise and, and intimacy with him, then they would begin to pray. Uh, for his will to be done on the earth. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, uh, incredible singing community. And these hymns, if, if I understand correctly, I think Zinzendorf was um, skilled in many different languages, mm. but he wrote those hymns in German, correct? Yeah, correct, yeah. 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 And he, you know, Charles Wesley was probably the greatest hymnist of all time with 5,000 hymns. Yeah. Isaac Watts is regarded probably more so than as much as Charles Wesley. I think he had five or 600 hymns. But Zinzendorf created 2,000 hymns. Now, I'm a songwriter. Uh, I've said this to you before, I think. I'm a songwriter. I've written somewhere between 50 to 100 songs. Wow. And, you know, that's, you know, that I feel that's an achievement. I'm not a great songwriter. I'm not a, a you know, a, 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 I haven't written a lot of songs. Some guys have written, like Paul McCartney's probably written, you know, 500. Um, because we only know the good ones he's, he's done, and that's typically the way. But Zinzendorf, over his lifetime, and he was writing a daily, a daily devotional all, all that time, every year, you know, the whole year, you know, six months in advance, and uh, he'd written 2,000 hymns. So it's a, an extraordinary um, musical and passionate ability to express his love for God. But he wasn't just a hymn writer, he was a preacher and a writer. Tell us more. Yeah. Well, let me go back, uh, if it's okay, Warwick, um, and uh, I think we need to talk about, so after this revelation of Christ crucified that burned into his heart, he starts these uh, prayer circles, as the, he's a young man now, he's a young man, um, teenager probably, maybe, maybe early 20s, um, he is writing hymns, so worship saturated prayer, but he also, God gave him a heart for the gospel to reach the ends of the earth where it was most needed. And uh, they started with uh, some of his friends and uh, uh, colleagues in school, what was called the uh, original order of the mustard seed. 
And this was started in 1716, and it was a group of school friends at the Hall Academy. This would be now in eastern Germany. And in a simple way, they saw their society, you might call it, as a kind of spiritual order of knighthood. Uh, dedicated not to personal honor or self-advancement, but to radical service of Jesus Christ the King. Now, this has nothing to do with Freemasonry, so don't think that. But the Lord gave them some simple rules that they committed themselves to live by, a, a covenant in a sense. And the rules they committed to live by would change and mature as the order grew. But the heart of their promise always remained the same. It was this. Number one, to be true to Christ. Be true to Christ. Number two, to be kind to people. And number three, to take the gospel to the nations. And so for these young men, true to Christ started off expressed mostly as their life of prayer, worship, personal holiness. Um, it would develop to include uh, the d different complex challenges of working with integrity in the midst of opposition. Uh, being kind to people encompassed a commitment to helping the poor, also learn to love their enemies and practice. And then, of course, their aspiration to take the gospel to the nations would lead to these pioneering missionary works across Europe and to every known part of the world. Amen. So I think that's an important uh, piece to remember in Zinzendorf's uh, young days. And it really helps shape a lot of, uh, it's like as he's living this out himself and with these small groups of people as a young man, as a teenager, this is the DNA then that began to mark this Moravian uh, young community. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's just fascinating the order of the mustard seed and that actually continued i think for i think for for many many decades i'm pretty sure correct yeah yeah yep. um and um now i know we're going to come back to 1727 and the moravian pentecost but let's just talk a bit more about zinzendorf and up until his death the last days of zinzendorf so you know he was a young man full of full of fire we are going to come back and talk a bit about this um, Moravian Pentecost in a second, so we'll hold that thought. But tell us, just just finish it off with Zinzendorf, pretending that you were trying to finish off his autobiography. Mm -hmm. or biography. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a that's a big statement. Um, praise the Lord. It's a, it's huge. <laughs> Zinzendorf, like I've read three of his biographies. No other man, Christian man, have ever read three biographies. I think I've read Billy Graham twice and Wesley twice and and uh, several other great church leaders uh, twice, but mm, he's the only one I've read three. I just I just find this whole story fascinating. But for for our listeners, uh, give it to us in uh, three or four minutes. Yeah. Well, um, after they uh, sent the Moravians, uh, Leonard Dober and Eichmann uh, off to do some missions work, which is again just the most astounding story. Um, Zinzendorf actually uh, got used him to influence a guy by the name of John Wesley and powerful story. We'll, again, we'll talk about that in a later, a later time. But it was Zinzendorf's passion to raise up these missionaries and really to send them all over the earth as the Holy Spirit touched them. Um, Zinzendorf, uh, throughout his lifetime, I mean, he went through a season where he was actually exiled from the Heron Hugh community, um, spent a number of years, 10 plus years. I think that was about five, five years, wasn't it? It was quite some time, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And a pretty difficult time for him as well. Um, but how the Lord was using him was, in a sense, to come alongside um, Lutheran pastors, Lutheran churches, and honor them and uh, help create communities or societies that would um, not bring division, but bring reformation, uh, really back to this place of personal relationship with Jesus. And uh, God had a real uh, a calling on Zinzendorf's life to be a man, to bring people together in a, an expression of John 17 oneness. Um, it's really fantastic. Um, you know, God sent him uh, several different places around the world, uh, into England, of course, um, throughout places in Europe, over to America to help establish 
different societies. Um, and, uh, you know, the Lord used him not just in the, in the, in the community of Herenhood, but also as a missionary himself being sent to uh, kind of lead the way. And I just, I just love that. Um, it's, like, it's like God is uh, raising him up, and as he goes, that others follow. It's like the Apostle Paul in that sense of, you know, imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. Uh, yeah, amen. He actually went to America. He also spent, he actually ended up living in London for uh, quite a few years. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, he actually then sort of moved around quite a lot, didn't he? He did, yeah. Yeah, he was a man on the move. <laughs> yes, sir. It's quite a story, you know, how, how the Lord, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, when you think about his imprint on Moravian missionaries, they recognize themselves as in debt to the world, as trustees of the gospel. Right. They, they were taught by Zinzendorf to embrace a lifestyle of self-denial, sacrifice, uh, simple, prompt obedience. Uh, they followed the call of the land to go anywhere with an emphasis upon the worst and the hardest places as having the first claim. Um, I mean, this, this idea of no soldiers of the cross have, have ever been bolder as pioneers, more patient or persistent in difficulties, more heroic in suffering or more entirely devoted to Christ and the souls of men than these Moravian missionaries. I mean, it's fantastic. The Moravians, uh, you know, were, were so radical in their commitment. But a lot of that was because of the imprint and the stamp of Zinzendorf's call and his lifestyle on these missionaries. Uh, so good. So good. That's amazing. And um, where... And how did he die? And what was the what was the date of his uh, passing from this planet? Yeah. So um, let me let me just talk about this real quick here. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about some of Zinzendorf's uh, flaws. You know, it's it's we, we we look at him as this giant of a man, um, but there were moments when he also struggled, and there was this point in his life, towards the end of his life, where he had been so focused on the blood of the lamb. I mean, almost too, too much emphasis, you might say. Um, an overemphasis, uh, almost a false spirituality. And it's one of the things I think we need to, to learn from is that you can almost overemphasize something to the neglect of other doctrines in your life. And I think that's a, that's a good lesson for us. Um, you know, what things in our lives do we need the Holy Spirit to show us to continue to grow in? Uh, what areas do we need to have some, uh, some further sanctification in? You know, are there areas where we have, we have almost emphasized too much? Um, yeah, and I, and I think those are things that, that Zinzendorf was reflecting on, you know, even towards the end of his life. Um, I find this often with great saints in throughout church history that, that the Lord will reveal things to impart to the next generation before they die. Um, and um, yeah, so Zinzendorf uh, dies May uh, 9th, 1760, and calls the church to that place of simplicity. Um, it was really a moment for him of entering into the fullness of rest. And he knew that the, the very wounds of Christ were meant to purchase him and the very drops of blood that were shed from Jesus were there to obtain him. And he was able to enter into that place of rest. So 1700 to 1760, I mean, what a rich, rich life. Not flawless, you know, with some... Uh, some issues like like all of us have, but a man deeply dedicated and committed to the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So let's go to the baptism of love, the Pentecost, the Moravian Pentecost on August 13, 1727. Give us a quick 
uh, update on the background in case those who weren't didn't see the very first session uh, would need to understand the incredible divisions and challenges that they had in that community coming from so many different parts of Europe. What happened? How did it happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, as we mentioned before, you know, these five years from 1722 to 1727, this community had struggled, right? They were experiencing dissension, bitterness, uh, judgment against one another, false teaching, accusation. And so Zinzendorf catches wind of this and he moves from Berdelsdorf, where he was living, to Herrenhut in 1727. Uh, Zinzendorf was uh, 27 years old at this time. And his heart, uh, his pastoral heart, propelled him to go from home to home. And in each home, he was preaching the cross of Christ. And he was pleading with this young community to forgive one another, to be reconciled with one another, to uh, grow in love for one another. Now, this culminated in May 12, uh, 1727 after a lecture by Zinzendorf, and they signed what was called the Brotherly Agreement. And they dedicated their lives to the service of Jesus Christ in a fresh way in this community. And it was really at this point that the Spirit began to move in a deeper way among them. Uh, July 22nd, the community covenanted to meet often in prayer and worship. And this began what would later be referred to as the Summer of Revival for this small Moravian community. Now, at the time of the revival in Herrenhut, 1727, there were about 220 people. They were living in 30 different homes in Herrenhut. 87 of the 220 were children. And Zinzendorf would come and he was... Uh, taking these kids under his wing, first in Bertelsdorf and later in Herrenhut. Uh, Zinzendorf had a special love for children and youth uh, since he had experienced God so much in his youth, uh, like we had just talked about. And so he'd spent significant time discipling the children and the youth and praying for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit on, the, on these kids. And the answer came first through the heart uh, um, uh, a heart of revival in this small 11-year-old. Her name was Susanna Cunell. And she'd been living in Herrenhut for about two years at this time. And on May 2nd, her godly mother had died. She'd gone home to be with Jesus with, with joy. And so this had impacted her in a, in a profound way. But on August 6th, after she had spent three days in prayer, Susanna, she was filled with this a uh, moment of indescribable joy at about 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I read about this in the journals. And she awakened her father, who had been a witness to everything. And, and she comes and she tells him, Father, now I, I believe now that I truly am a child of God, like my, like my mom. And now I know how it was, and still it was, with my mother. Her father went the next morning to the Count, to Count Zinzendorf, and told him what had happened. And there he heard the news that in the same night, three other girls had also experienced revival and they were weeping uh, to experience the grace of God. The Zinzendorf then called them all to himself and these kids and he prays over them and blesses them and through their testimony many other children were revived as well during this summer. These children along with the adults then began praying for a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. And I just, I wanted to share that because I believe it's a powerful testimony that God responded to the prayers of children and youth in releasing an outpouring of the Spirit, this Moravian Pentecost, that led to the first 24-7 prayer and missions movement among Protestant churches. Now, over the course of the summer, they had come together in unity, and in one accord, uh, they had been emptying themselves of idolatry, and now they were ready to receive a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, this was just a remnant of the people that were part of this community, part of this, those that had signed this brotherly agreement, this covenant uh, to love one another. Um, <clears throat> but in 
But there was still a, a remaining uh, group of people amongst the Moravians that still were fairly divided and weren't experiencing this yet. Uh, this continues to, to grow, and we're going to culminate in, on August 13th. But August 5th, Zinzendorf and 14 others decided to spend the night in prayer to God. And then August 10th, Pastor Roth, he was, he was like the senior pastor of the community. He comes under such an overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he wrote in one of his journals that he, he, he sank down into the dust under the conviction of the presence of the Lord. The entire community then begins to be to follow, and and they and they continued until midnight in prayer. They were singing, they were praying, uh, they were weeping and travailing. And then on August 13, 1727, uh, there the whole community now is called together because people were hearing about the reports of the revival that had already began to start with the children and now some of the adults praying through the night. And so on August 13th, they're walking from Herrenhut to the Lutheran church in Berdelsdorf. Uh, still a bit divided. In fact, half of the community is on one side, half the community is on the other side. <laughs> and Zinzendorf shares again a powerful sermon on the cross and the glory of the Lamb. And after further confession of sin uh, and reconciliation amongst the brethren, they came to the communion table. And it was in this moment the Holy Spirit falls upon them. So powerful that many refer to it as a, as a Moravian Pentecost. They received the love of God. It was poured and shed abroad into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. It spilled out then into this extraordinary love for one another. Others referred to it as a baptism of love. Now one quote, it says, after... August 13th, there was such a movement in the fellowship that the, the bushes on the Hootberg, that was the hill where they were up praying often, were filled with brothers, sisters, and children day and night who on their knees or prostrate prayed, wept, and sang. The children prayed until 1 a.m. on the Hootberg from the 13th until the 17th. Like every night until 1 a.m. before they went to, to bed. They would, they would sing through the village back to their homes in Berdelsdorf where there spoke of one story where the mother of one told her daughter to be quiet and not cry out so loud you're going to wake up the whole area. <laughs> so amazing what God was doing. The, the revival amongst the children had such a great influence on the parents and the, and the rest of the inhabitants. Hallelujah. So when did the 100 year prayer meeting start? And we know that it probably, it could have gone for, there's a debate, it could have actually gone for 120 years, but let's just talk about 100 years for the sake of, um, you know, ease. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we know for, that for an absolute fact. So when did it actually start yeah. from that? It, it started out of that, that Moravian Pentecost, that outpouring of the spirit, yeah. that time communion service, forgiveness, yeah. healing. Yeah. Um, it was after that, this, but... uh, the outpouring that the Lord spoke to Zinzendorf uh, from the passage in Leviticus 6, verse 13, that says that the fire should never go out on the altar. And so because of the sacrifice of Christ, they should, the people of God should be responding then with unceasing night and day prayer with worship. Right, because of the absolute worth of Jesus. And so um, after he gets this verse, then it was on August 26, August 26, so a couple weeks later, that they launched the canopy of prayer. And it was launched with 24 men and 24 women. And they were committed to an hour of prayer each day. So a person would commit to the same hour each day, and this was called hourly intercession in response to Christ's exhortation, right, to Peter at Gethsemane, could you not watch with me one hour? Now we know from this list that it actually included seven names of some of the revived girls committed to praying an hour a day and eventually increased from 48, so from 24 men, 24 women, to 77. So 77 out of a community of maybe 220 or so, 
many of these were just simple. I love this. Simple, ordinary believers, right? They were housewives, craftsmen, bakers, children. And this committed prayer chain, it swept through the community, and it lasted over a hundred plus years. Now, we know that they didn't just pray in one location, like in a building, but in their normal lives, at homes, on prayer walks, during work breaks, uh, praying through the night. They would often be praying in twos and threes during their committed hours of prayer. And their, their mission statement was, was this, one on the field, one at home, one to pray, and one to go. So uh, someone's always praying if someone's going to go to work. So just, just I want to make sure my math is correct because I come from Australia. We're a little bit slow down here. So that's four. Is that Just go for that again. One, two, three, four. Is that right? Uh, no, it's just like the idea was um, one is in the field working. There's one at home praying. Or there's one to pray and there's one to go. So before you go to work or before you go on mission or before you, you're going to go do ministry, there's always somebody praying during that time of mission. That makes sense? Yeah, so it was sort of actually uh, one and one. Yeah, correct. So, yeah. you know, I'm going to, whether I'm working or on the mission field, mm. we always have someone praying. Amen. Uh, yeah. 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 And uh, now this was also, yeah. a, it's also a singing community. And so they would gather together in the mornings and the evenings to start and end their day in songs of praise as a community. So they would take at least 15 minutes, sometimes longer, but it was at a minimum of 15 minutes, morning and evening, they would come together and they would sing songs of praise. Fantastic. Now, it was uh, also during an evening service on May 3rd, 1728, that Zinzendorf started what was called the watchword. And Zinzendorf gave them a verse from scripture, a watchword for the next day. And so the Moravians who had been at the service took this word to the 30 plus homes and exhorted them to use this verse for the next day's prayer and worship focus. And these watchwords were compiled and eventually published. I think it was in 1731, one for each day of the year. And they called this the daily text. And so this informed them in their times of prayer. Uh, they, would, they would always start with praying scripture. Uh, during their hourly intercession. Now, Zinzorov also would gather the committed hourly intercessors, that were those that were committed to an hour a day. He would gather them once a week to share prayer points with them for the community and then also for missions. And prayer for them was primarily outward. So their hourly intercession wasn't uh, just their devotional time with Jesus, but this was actually focused on praying outward kingdom focused prayer so rather than just simply praying for individual needs they would cry out for other communities uh, cry out for missionaries on the field cry out for the lost uh, cry out for the gospel to go forth in power for the lord of the harvest to hurl forth laborers into the harvest fields of the nations um, amen and amen the, the watch word uh, would be similar to the daily bread uh, my wife gets Correct. The daily bread in a mobile phone, uh -huh. and it's got a uh, spoken word scripture. Mm -hmm. You can play it. It's usually got a song, perhaps as well. Mm -hmm. There's a scripture and there's a thought uh, to inspire people to love Jesus, to inspire people to, to worship Jesus. Yeah. I was just thinking about it, Jason. If if uh, Zinz North was alive today, he'd be using all of those things. He'd be using the web. He'd be using YouTube. Yeah. He'd be using social media. And he would be, because this was pretty, like, I'm not sure that people had done this before. Maybe they'd had. Um, certainly there was the liturgy, a yearly liturgy in the in the Catholic Church and the, and the Lutheran Church, which continued on a lot of the, the Catholic liturgy and just, you know, just transformed it. Yeah. But this was quite radical, if I understand correctly. Uh, and the, then he, his whole life, basically, he would, he would always have to be writing uh, the next year, sort of next year's sort of watchwords for the day. Uh, am I correct in saying what I've just said? Yep, correct. And I think the lesson here too for us is that Zinzendorf understood that people that were committed to hourly intercession needed to be fed the Word of God, right? It was a, it was a diet of truth, and it helped to direct their prayers. And we trust the sovereignty of God to 
to organize that and, and, and in particular what verses should they be praying and the Lord would obviously oversee all this but I think that's so, so important that um, we need to teach people how to pray they need to be equipped in prayer they need to be given uh, prayer points and information so that this can stay healthy and and really it's you know without this it won't be sustainable right there there's moments when when he had to he would get them together once a week to develop community amongst the intercessors. So they, they had this sense of family. and We're all in this together. Let's keep going. Those things are so critical to continue in day and night prayer, especially for prayer that would last 100 years. Amen. Yeah, and getting back to this um, scene, um, I've, I've been reading you know books about revival and different historians talking about revival. And I was uh, reading one... Um, evangelical author a very respected author and he was talking about how you've got to be careful that you don't sing too much right mm. now um i get what he was saying to a certain extent this is in a, revi in a revival context because you actually need i mean it's the old story uh we know this well you and i uh there's, there's a saying you know too much spirit in your block too much word in your dry up mm. so the truth's always in the tension of the spirit and the word mm -hmm. Um, you know, Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit and they are life. Mm. So we need the word of God and we need the life of God, which is contained in the word. Mm. And yet we need the spirit to illuminate the word mm. and to bring us life. And I would argue that we need both the scriptures and we need corporate worship. Yeah, and we need to, and the, there's this tension always, you know, oh, we don't worship enough. Oh, we don't preach enough. You know, there's this sort of tension. What, what we've got to learn, I believe, and learn from Zinzendorf, who actually lived in the tension, yeah. uh, wrote 2,000 hymns, was, you know, probably would have, the equivalent would have been, you know, 100 albums or 200 album, 200, you know, music albums, worship albums. That's that's the equivalent. In fact, it's probably even bigger than that. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. tremendous worship community, a bit like Hillsong or Bethel, you know, those two churches which are producing an enormous amount of new songs. Yeah. Here is Zinzendorf, uh, basically a sort of wellspring of life and worship, not just in Germany and Hernhut, but but basically touching the whole world mm. in his own fashion. Yeah. I mean, you know, Wesley talks about hearing the um, hearing the the Moravians singing in the middle of the storm. Yeah. Wesley was sheltering in the cabin. Mm. The, the ship was getting tossed backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, the water was rushing to the ship. They would have been drenched. They would have been cold. They were fearing for their life because it was a the storm went for a number of days, mm. and here is the Moravians singing yeah. hymns yeah. in the middle of the storm. And John Wesley says, "Why are you singing?" They said, "Well, we're not afraid to die because mm. we want to worship Jesus. We want to glorify Jesus with our life." Mm. And in, in a sense, um, you know, this fire on the altar, they weren't. It wasn't just dry scriptures. Mm -hmm. They were living scriptures, yeah. and they're living a life of worship. Any comments? Yeah, amen. Well, Zenzendorf understood Jesus when he said that the Father is seeking worshipers in spirit and in truth. So that combination is so critical. That's what attracts the presence of the Lord, I think. Um, you think about John 15. He says, those who you know abide in me and my words abide in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you that the father might be glorified in the son and so this place of abiding in communion with christ by the holy spirit and yet the word of god the truth of the scriptures in us right in our minds and in our hearts deeply rooted in truth and yet in this place of intimacy and communion and fellowship with jesus uh, it's out of that place and we ask and God answers. Hallelujah. And he's glorified. No, look, it's just been uh, absolutely fantastic talking to you, Jason, today. Uh, it's a joy to hear your heart for our dear brothers, the Moravians. And we are going to go into the next session. We're going to be talking a bit about the missions movement. And we're going to go into some details about many things that they achieved. Uh, incredible stuff they've achieved. But certainly... It came because of this deep love for Jesus, mm. a deep revelation of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, mm. and a heart overflowing with 
love and worship yeah. both to god first mm -hmm. and then as as you've said from that covenant that they agreed to um to love each other yeah. and uh, that that was actually in the mustard seed covenant but it was also in the in the hernut moravian mm -hmm. covenant uh that they actually agreed together yeah. uh from that time on the 13th of august 1727 when they had that moravian pentecost it became a a moment of time a bit like the the, the second chapter acts when they mm. it just completely transformed them and they began to start to look out yeah. from that point on didn't they just seemed to be um I, I would imagine they were looking out before then to be truthful but mm. it's it's as if they really were compelled by the spirit yeah. filled with the spirit mm. and launched into world evangelism which we'll talk about in the next session correct yeah, correct amen god bless you Thank you so much. Thanks.